Welcome to the Casey Digital Podcast. Um, this week, I'll be talking to David Walter, who's a founder, entrepreneur, chairman, um, former fashion photographer, and he's an all-around eccentric guy. So hopefully, this will be quite an interesting listen for you guys. <laughs> David, um, for those who don't know you, um, please can you just give a quick introduction about who you are and what you've been working on in the past? Well, before I go into that, let me just give it a little anecdote. What I can't stand <laughs> are when people say to me, you're not from Manchester, are you? Because you don't sound like you're from Manchester. It's so bloody insulting. Oh, they talk like this or something like that, you know. Like, a bit like me. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah, a bit like Paul here. But, you know, yeah, okay, I'm Manchester born and bred. I have, I'm, you know... I've had a great life. I've travelled all over the world working um, and, you know, ending up sort of almost living in Miami for three years and places like that. So I've, I've got a fairly comprehensive overview of what it's like to be outside Manchester, but I've always come back to Manchester. I'm sort of born and bred. This is where my parents were. And, you know, they had draper shops and and I just I just enjoyed the north. Uh, there's no wrong with it, as they say. And um, for those who are looking... Uh, kind of uh, what you've worked on in the past and for the, the projects that you've worked on in the past, which are varying, obviously, in, in different sizes and scales. Um, if we were looking back at the beginning of when you started out in the industry, um, when you started out as a fashion photographer, um, can you tell us about how you got into the industry and how that all started? Okay. I I, I just became an assistant fashion photographer. I, I, I saw, you know, I had these sort of vague ambitions of going into graphics design and I got the right education and that sort of thing. I was off the job with fashion photographer and I took it um, because I thought this is going to be really exciting and interesting. And I, so as, a, as an assistant for fashion photographer, two weeks after joining this company called Gun Studios, that's got one to go a long time ago, I found myself in Tunisia and I thought, this is it. This is what I'm going to do for my life. I'm going to become a fashion photographer. So as the next four to five years, I worked in that company and I built myself to senior photographer um, I got myself an office because that made me look like I had authority. And uh, I started to sort of employ people for that business. And opportunities came along because the guy who owned the business became an alcoholic. And as he became an alcoholic, I got more and more work and had to push myself out throughout that business. And I became the lead photographer. People wanted me. I started to develop a name. And then I pushed out and went out and started my own business. And what, what year was this roughly? And this was about, about 40 years ago. Right. Now, the world is a different space. But, but, you know, there are certain learnings you can take from, from the beginning that, of, of my career that, that are right today, but they're far more difficult to, uh, to achieve. And that is, in those early days, I recognized that to underpin myself financially, I needed to, to have something. I had nothing. So I bought property. I bought myself a little tiny cottage in Middleton. And I did it up and it was worth 13,000 pounds. And I went to the bank and I said, give me 10 grand because I've got to buy some photographic equipment. And they said, OK. So they gave me 10,000 quid and I bought photographic equipment and I started on my own. And I recognized that what I needed to do was underpin myself with something that was that, that, that I could sort of, you know, huck around and, and think, well, OK, you know, I built this. Give me some money against yeah. it and I'll, and I'll build a business. Uh, but, the, but the point about it is that it was a very, very different photographic world. Um, and... I, I I I was intuitively creative with everything that I did because you were mainly shooting for catalogs, weren't you? Yeah, I was, you, you were, I was, I was, everything was for um, catalogs or billboards. It was, it was, for, it was a catalogs, advertising, promotion material. Um, I, I I did bits for magazines, but I, I recognised that really because I was in Manchester. I couldn't really progress because you, you have to be in London to be a, a, with, with yeah. in, in the in the major fashion magazines. Right. Okay. And then obviously. <laughs> Starting your own business is, it brings its own challenges just in general. Um, obviously, it requires entrepreneurial tendencies and, and behaviours to, to grow things over time. What, what were the kind of early lessons that you learned from setting up you know, your own business? Because that includes, obviously, you need to do things like finance and all the other things you know, that, that are involved around um, setting up new business. How did you approach that? And you know, what was your approach towards the kind of trying to grow that, that I, new I, startup? I, I recognized that I could get pushed off in all sorts of different directions. I was finance and financing the rest of it. And I, I, but the most important thing was being bloody good at what I did. 
Um, and perception the is everything. Of the work. Yeah. Yeah. Perception is everything. Yeah. In every industry, perception is everything. Yeah. So I got I got a really lucky break in so far that in, in on Portland Street in Manchester, a computer center had, had gone under, and I took over this computer center, and it was the most stunning environment. So I put my pictures around the walls, I opened and I opened up an office in there, and people came in and thought, wow, this guy's really successful. Look at yeah. this. He can afford this great environment, <laughs> these beautiful walls, doors, thick carpets, and everything. Of course, this was all built by the by the company that was there before, but nobody knew that. You just took over what I just was there. What was there. <laughs> and so, people, so, so suddenly, you know, work, work became in. And, 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 and the, 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 the biggest thing at the right beginning of all this was I had two or three people around me who were fantastic. Yes. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I had this like a girl Friday, a PR girl, PA, and, and she was bloody great. So, I, so these are the times you know, we used to actually write letters. And, and I used to dictate. Before email, yeah. Yeah, yeah before. I used to, we had to, to write letters. Well, she would write the letters, and I would dictate the letters. And they were, they, were, they, were, they were funny. They were crazy. They were, they were offering people all sorts of wonderful opportunities. And that sort of, that's never really stopped. That sort of stayed with me. Yeah. But also, that concept that perception is everything. Yeah. How you look, how you feel, how you talk, how you communicate. That's it. That's what people want. Knowing what your strengths are, bringing people in to yeah. work on the areas where you're not as strong, and then also that yeah. communication with clients. Obviously, it's never, it's never really changed. It doesn't matter what area you're in or what, what generation but, it is. It's you but, know, but, still but the one thing I learned at an early stage is that to, to be successful, <coughs> you have to take people with you. And yeah, and, and so building and wherever I went, and I was shooting all over the world. I, I you know, I. I I, every every couple of weeks, I'd be off for a week, two weeks, or three weeks shooting. The crews you took with you were, were fundamental to your success. Yes. And so you had to pick those crews that people had to be right. You had to motivate them. You had to understand them. And you had to deal with all the fallout of, of all these beautiful people that I was traveling around. With. <laughs> what, a, what a really yeah. challenging, yeah, yeah well, going to exotic locations with beautiful people. Yeah, yeah. Must have been such a, <laughs> such a challenge for you. Um, obviously, a lot's changed over the years. Um you know, through the digitization and then obviously the, the kind of dot com boom during that period of time as well. What are the what are the, the kind of top two or three things that you think have mainly changed from the early days back in the kind of seventies, early eighties well, through the, to where we're at today? The biggest single thing was was the introduction of digital photography. Yeah. I mean we used to shoot on film. And um, so we'd go away for a week or two weeks and we would shoot hundreds, if not thousands of rolls of film. And you wouldn't see any of it till you got home and had it processed. Or you particularly find a location where you could process your film. But as a photographer, you could do all sorts of things with that film. You could push it when it was being processed. You could pull it. It was too dark, too light. And you, this, this, was, this was a sort of a fundamental um, knowledge that you had about how to work and develop with film. When digital came along, it was absolute bloody chaos. Yeah. Because often you do shoots where you shoot on film and digital because digital was falling over all the time. People didn't know how to make it work properly, how to how to push digital out to the printers. And so you know, there was four to five years of total mayhem in this in this industry. And but for the one, you know, and I, I had a you know at that time an eighty five thousand pound uh, Refema processing machine for my film, and I just said right, you know, one day just get rid of it. And we'd bend it, and that was it. And the entire company then went digital overnight, and we just learned as we went along. Because you were previously working with labs, weren't you? Yes. So, like, so, so you have to find so, like a local so, lab. So, so, so where you go in the, in, in the world, and Miami was one of the centers for photography in those early days, because they, they, they're putting processing laboratories. South Africa putting processing laboratories. This, the, but then all major cities have them. So you could work in Paris and New York and, yeah. and, and places like that, and, and you find because there'd be a lab there for you to process your film. And obviously, going away... Traveling away now or, or doing a shoot. So if you liken it to an Instagram photographer who goes away and they don't need any, they just need their mobile phone. They literally don't need anything. So that entire kind of crew, the process and everything else is condensed down into from a five, ten man crew and a shed load of film to I mean, something that can fit in your pocket. Yeah, you still, you still, I mean, the, those days, well, you still need a profession today. You still need yes. a decent kit. Yes. But we, we'd go away with 20, 30 cases of equipment. You know, we go away with Hasselblad. We go away with Canons and Nikons. We go away with massive amounts of lighting if the weather was weather changed and there's some battery packs. And and then and then of course we had to take all the all the, the clothing as well. I mean, we we were like a travelling circus out there. <laughs> the thing as well that always astounds me when I talk to you about this is you're only seeing the output of the work that you've done further down the line, whereas yeah, I mean, now we, it's instant. Yeah, right? we, we, it's instant. We, we, we go away for two to three weeks shooting and we would spend two or three hundred thousand quid on these shoots and you see nothing till you get back home. And 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 so you really have to be secure in, 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 in your art and really know what you were doing. 
You know, it was yeah. uh, it, the, the, the risk factor was huge. And so more and more, the more you know, so the more you shot, the more confident the client became in you, recognized that you would come back, you would deliver the film, you would deliver the, the, the film that it was right. That's what clients wanted at the end of the day. It wasn't just being creative. It was actually delivering the job at the end of the day as well, which is very important. So, David, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the kind of successful projects that you've been involved in over the years? Obviously, um, as an entrepreneur, you've been involved in a number of different businesses, but I'm just thinking specific or smaller scale in terms of projects or campaigns. What are the kinds of things that you've been involved in that are really successful? So, so well, really, it's interesting because it breaks into two things. Okay, there's the photographic side, which you can't see because it's a podcast. You've got the photographic side and, and, you know, some really nice pictures that have taken over the years. But over and apart from that is building a business. And, and underpinning that business, and 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 you know, I, I, at one time I bought the huge estate in in, in Middleton, a, a huge country estate. Um, I lived in half of it and put um, uh, models and stylists and uh, hair and makeup artists on that flew in from from, flew in from all over the world. Yeah. And opened it as a as a as a mini hotel to service the the photography that went on in Manchester. What was it? So hotel it was, Walt. You know, just, just something <laughs> like that. Yeah. It was called Thorncliffe Hall. It was bloody wonderful. Um, okay, okay. Uh, but you know, I had a gardener and a, a cook and a and a chauffeur and a you know everything. It was a complete it was a complete it was a proper infrastructure for a hotel. Yeah. And and it was it was wonderful because it made us it saved us a bloody fortune because we didn't have to use hotels. You'd have to go over and also it gave us it gave us a great environment to bring everybody over 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 to uh, to the UK. That's correct. But the but the biggest so pro, real project we worked on was when we were asked to go by Argos to go and open uh, or test um, home shopping in India. Uh, we'd gone to China the year before this happened, uh, trying to to see if it was possible to set up a creative industry in China, a business in China. And, you know, it cost a lot of money and we had a Mandarin speaking girl. And but quite frankly, this is a whole other story. But for me, it was very, very painful. Um, also, the fact that I'm fairly enthusiastic when I talk, and to have to have an work an interpreter who would just hold my head, how do you, how does that translate? Who never moved? Yeah. Or anything, you thought, well, am I getting the story across here? Probably not. But anyway, while all this was going on, we were approached by Argos to see if we could look at opening, a, a, producing home shopping catalog in India, and you know, I flew out with Jane Riley, who was the managing director of Photolink at the time. And we flew into a Mumbai. There was absolute bloody chaos, complete <laughs> chaos. And it was extraordinary. But they, you know, but again, luck had it that my wife had had coffee with uh, a Mumbai film director, an Indian film director, a couple of weeks before and said, oh, if your husband's going, tell him to get in touch, he's got a problem. I instantly called him when I arrived. I've got a problem. Yeah. And, and, and the guy then said, well, what do you need? I said, I need the best production girl in India. And he gave me, and he found me one. A girl called Dipika. Dipika. She was amazing. I said, "This is what we want to achieve. Can we do it?" So Jane and I just flew around like crazy for a week, looking at everything, everything aspect of of could we produce a catalog? And we thought, "Yes, we can." So we went back, reported back to all and said, "Okay, go for it." Um, and they paid us a nice fat fee, and we went out. And within ten weeks, we we hired uh, or, 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 or we we brought in forty five Indian. Uh, individuals with all sorts of different expertise, matched them up with 25 people that we took over from, from Manchester. We rented a Bollywood studio for 10 weeks, which cost a bloody fortune. <laughs> and we produced the first home shopping catalog in India ever, yeah. from the ground up, from concept to design to photography to artwork, the whole thing, right? The Fully produced the whole, you know, the whole thing. thing. And this was so this circa 2008? Yeah. Around, around that time? Yeah, around, around that time, yeah. And, and you know, and, and we produced that one, and then we produced another one. We recognised while we were doing this that really this this was not going to fly. This, this there were too many problems. The culture was too complex. It was too difficult. Everywhere there were mama and papa stores, um, and and you know you you couldn't sustain this working out of a Bollywood studio. So we started to look to open our own place, and that's another story again. Yes, yes. So we won't go into that one right now. But that was successful. Yes, it was, and you know, we were the first independent creative agency ever to open in India. And obviously working over in foreign countries, which you're obviously accustomed to, but I think working with a British brand in a foreign country to test something that they, you know, they think is conceptually plausible and then going through the pain for them, obviously, that's that's a massive part of it. But I think the other thing that came out of that, like you said, is um, the growth of Photolink India and, and then us in Manchester um, recognising that, these skills, there's a skill set, there's a marketplace over there. And I think during that time, really, um, the only 
scale of services that would have been outsourced or offshored at that time would have been maybe IT or technology services yeah, early stage, so but was, even that would have been yeah. quite early stage. I, I, at that, I think, that but equally, you know, in, in pushing out to someone like that, people see you as 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 a, as a progressive company yes. because you know you just don't want to be in the UK. You want to look at the rest of the world, and so and that's you know again about perception. Um, but we actually did it. Yes. We, you know, and and you know, I'm extremely proud of that success. Um, you know, parts of it fell off, um, for the wheels fell off a little bit as we were going along towards after the last after a couple of years. But then, but we retained there an exceptional photographic, uh, video and offshoring company and it's still going today. Yes. Oh, well, we've been there together. <laughs> we have. We went for like, do you remember? We went for like 48 hours. We flew to, we flew to Dubai and then we went to Mumbai. We went for two meetings and then we flew back. <coughs> and it was, I remember coming back and my body clock was just all over yeah, the it show. Was, it, it was very was, weird. It was complicated. Okay. But we, of course, we used to go out there for weeks at a time. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, we but, first setting up but, but I think one of the most exciting and wonderful thing was telling <coughs> people from Manchester. Some people have left Manchester have never been abroad before. And suddenly they found themselves yeah. in Mumbai yeah. to a photographic shoot. Never, no. I've, I've only ever been to Blackpool and then yeah. now I'm going to go to, to Mumbai. Mumbai. Yeah. And so, so, so <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful thing to do. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to offer people that. A lot of the guys who still yeah. work here were part of the team yeah, that set it up. So like Jenny, yeah. Billy and Matt and Mike yep. was over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. That was it's, 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 and it's great fun and it's thrilling to be able to take people out and give people opportunity. It's an, it yeah. is an amazing place, Mumbai, isn't it? I, 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 obviously, I've been three times at youth of you've probably been about 50 times, but um, <clears throat> the thing that I got about it was just how much the Indian kind of localized Indian culture in Mumbai is so unique. Um, but also they absolutely love the British. Like I did, I didn't realize how well, they, they saw they, they love the British because they, 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 yeah, but also they love the British because basically they know that we need them now. Yes. And that's why they love us. And because, it's changed. Yeah, because, it? it's yeah. changed that, that, that shift has been huge. Yeah. And, and you, you, you can't underestimate that, you know, that yeah. the, their, the position that they're in and the strength that they, they have with one of the most progressive nations in the world, albeit rife with, you know, serious problems of corruption and, and yeah. poverty, it is still a highly, highly progressive nation. Massive. Opening, you know, one university a month is opening out there. Yeah. You know, hundreds of thousands of really bright students are pouring out of those universities. And, you know, and they're going all over the world. Yeah. And, and, they're and then they're taking all that back home again. Yeah. So, you know, so it, it is a very dynamic culture, along with Russia and, and China. So there's a lot of um, businesses and you know various things that you've been involved in. And I think one of the things that's interesting to balance both, you know, here's here's some some great examples of successful things that you've done throughout your career. I mean, what what are the things that you look back on and go, you know, that was something that didn't quite work out, but it was a big learning curve. Is, is there anything that comes to mind initially? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, I, there's a couple of things. First of all, first of all when you know I, I bought the old schoolhouse in on, in the early days for absolutely for bloody peanuts. Um, and I had a client that came along, and, and well, I bought it, the whole of it. Then I sold half of it, um, which was great because it almost lost, you know, I, I was almost cost neutral on it. Yes. A few years down the line, um, you know, I had to buy the other half back, and it cost me a bloody fortune compared to what you paid oh, originally. It was astronomical because the guy the knew he got me. Was it like three um, or four years later? Four right? years. Four years. Right. Okay. And four years, the the the, the, English, the British economy. Had it boomed, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and 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 this guy recognised absolutely that I needed that space. Was this and late eighties? Yeah, and uh, yeah, and okay, I knew that, you know, in essence, you know, I, and I overpaid for it tenfold, but I had to have it. And so, the, the, so what? So the, the, the favourite fairly was I sort of never let the bloody thing go in the first place. I sort of just let it out, Held on rented to the it out, and, and not sold it. it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so because at the end of the day, I'd be better borrowing than the money. So these are sort of little things you learn as you go along. Yeah. And the other failure, certainly not my favourite failure, was trying to set up our, our own independent photographic studio in Mumbai, and that was that 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 was a failure on a level that was just absolutely extraordinary. Right. Um, and that's another that's another podcast. All well, so. what, well, rather than go into too much detail, what what were the main learnings from it? In terms uh, let's of see. High level? Uh, within, within the course of uh, a period of one month, I had one guy dead. I had uh, my CEO being sort of locked up into prison. I had the police come in and smash the place to bits. Um, and that's just the beginning of it. Okay, so, I think so, we might leave so, it so, there. So, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 as failures go, yeah, well, okay. And yeah, what is the lowest about, about a quarter of a million quid? Right. I'm trying to make it work. Right, okay. Right. Um, we'll leave that one there for legal yeah. reasons. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know where we go yeah. from there. Okay. Um, I think um, a good place to kind of... Um, start off a new kind of segment of the conversation is um, 
throughout the years the, the, and throughout your you know, through your education through the early years and then where you're at today um you know what are the biggest influences on your career the, the, the biggest the, the, and I've, I've mentioned this a few times so people sort of look at me blankly because they don't know this guy the biggest influence in my life was Edward Dibono yeah um without, without question it was him um you know as a student I used to sort of read his work and thought lateral thinking okay how does it work what do you do how do you join disparate elements together and and make them work and 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 it's so if you if you follow him, it is so exciting uh, because you look at everything differently. If you look at something differently, you can create a business because all the best businesses are born out of somebody having a different perception. Yeah. So Edward de Bono was very much my guru and my guide. And, I, and, and the other day I actually bought back a book that he'd written called Why So Stupid? And it really looks at the human race and he thinks, you know what? We are so brilliant and so stupid at the same time. Like, you know, we, we elect President Trump. Who you know has one dream that seems to be destroy the bloody planet, while the rest of the planet is trying to save the planet. And you think, what's that? Happen? What happened with Brexit? How did that come about? Why are we so bloody stupid? Yeah. You know, what's a democracy? We don't. We don't you know. Democracies actually don't work. What you need is a bloody good leader to advise you and take you forward. But they screw up all the time. Yeah. And so you know, we we live in as I said, we live in bloody weird times. But if if you read Edward de Bono and you understand what he says and what he talks about, he's eighty six now. And if you just look at some of the brilliant ideas that come up, you go, okay, I get this. How can I start to think like that? And there are various schools that teach the, of the Edward Bonus School of Thinking. And there are hundreds of people today that believe they can mentor people through not so it's bullshit. You know, you've got to be brilliant like Edward Bono is to really be able to influence your life. And he influenced my life. Good. So he wasn't just a mentor on the business side of it. Or, you know what, you're not, you're not feeling very happy today? Hmm, have a nice bowl of ju green juice in the morning. <laughs> I ain't going to feel fucking great. Yeah, yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> Shit. But, you know, so it, there's a lot more depth to actually changing how you how you how the perception you have on life than just the, the fluff that goes around today. You know, because hot yoga isn't going to do it for you. Well... That's the only <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a full quote. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Edward Devono, <laughs> No Heart Yoga. Uh, yeah. In terms of um, when you're going out and trying to kind of um, influence other people or give advice to other people, I know because we've shared books in the past. What are the books that you've kind of, what's the most gifted book? What's the, the, the book or the piece of advice or content that you've kind of, you think gives the most the, value I mean, the, one, the, I, 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 the, the whole book's bloody boring. It's about the history of Google and how it, how it came about. But there's four pages in it of how they select their staff, their people, which is just bloody brilliant. And, and, there is, and, and in essence, the essence is you go for the person, not the bloody job role. Smart creative. Get the yeah. right person into a space. And you can adapt to anything and yeah. be anything. Yeah. Okay, you might have to have, you know, you might be able to work in a particular sector. But if the people are right and that culture is right, employ them, work with them, work together, and, and wonderful and magical things will happen. So I know the book that you're referencing, obviously being quite heavily in the world of digital, but um, one day I came into the office and there was a book on my desk and there was a book on everyone else's desk. And we just thought the book fairy had been, and it was how Google works, but it was actually David had come round and put the, the book on the desk of certain people in the business and said to people, look, you need to read this book. And I think it's in in the in how Google works, it's from um, the founders of, of Google and saying how they built things up. But this whole concept around smart creatives is yeah. essentially, yeah. you know, dynamic yeah. people who can work in different spaces, don't necessarily work to a fixed schedule or a fixed way of working Um a team of problem sol solvers, innovators, that kind of thing, and yeah. focusing I, I, on the person. Absolutely, I, I think the one. That, but all creative, you read all the books you get today. People are slowly begin to recognise that creativity is the essence of everything. Yes. Any ideas? You know, people say, "Oh, I'm not creative." Well, if you're not creative, quite frankly, you're never going to do anything in your life. Yeah. You're never going to build any business if you're not creative. So you can, you have to be a creative accountant, a creative solicitor, a creative whatever you want to be. But you still have to think. You still have to think of a different idea or a different way of approaching something. I think or, it's, or a a it's got a perception. It's got a perception that so, you need so, to be so, a designer yeah. to be yeah. creative. So, no. I think it's not, so it's not far away. You just have to think different. Yeah. Right. And I think that's when it goes into smart creatives. I think that when when I talk to people from a digital perspective, you might not be a digital designer, but you might work on PPC or paid social or social media or whatever it might be. 
but you can come up with creative ways because all all it's doing essentially, like you said, is looking at things from different perspectives and trying to come to the table with with better and stronger ideas. So I think that's a, a, a kind of a good piece of advice. For but people. my, my you see, I'm just reading what you've written here. What's your most gifted book? Which is quite nice, actually. So, but did anybody give me a book? Well, not many people have, because I made a book bloody thousands of my own. But the most gifted book I've ever had was when I was six years old, and they gave me here a book uh, that was filled in by everybody, uh, a page, and uh, of what people thought about me. And I thought that was absolutely bloody brilliant. Yeah, we won't go into the bits that I wrote about <laughs> you. <laughs> um, with um, with anything, any kind of business leader, I, I'm quite interested in this and I've kind of got this from um, a guy called Tim Ferriss who's, who has a, a very popular podcast and um, he always asks people and I think it's a good thing to ask people is you know what kind of routines or rituals do you have what are the things that you do on a regular basis um, whether that's in the morning or you know like hot yoga like we said before <laughs> you know what, what are the what are the kinds of things that you that you do on a regular basis that keeps you you know ticking along because where you're currently at i don't want to obviously divulge your age but you you have more enthusiasm than than most 21 year olds about what you're actually doing and i think that that's infectious so i'm curious about what keeps that energy I, I, going. okay I, I think it's because it's looking for new and exciting moments in one's life yeah and and, and okay i've been very lucky okay and, and i have this phrase that i use which in my voice is how did i get here and and often i you know i've been <laughs> in some of the most beautiful countries in the world and i think how did i get here how did I get here? <laughs> what the hell? This is amazing. Yeah. And and so I used to say that to myself. And 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 still now, when I find myself in a beautiful space, or I mean, or or I go somewhere really exciting, or I meet some really interesting people, I say to myself, "How did I get here?" And 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 then I think, "Wow, you can really you can really make your own luck. You really can." Yeah. And 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 I think you know, I mean, what came off the back of the Indian thing was me going to the House of Commons and and talking to MPs and ministers about how to open businesses in India. Mm. And they didn't like me, I was too honest. But, and you can't be that in politics. But it, it was, and I, I, when I first went to the House of Commons, I thought, wow, how did I get here? Yeah. You know, so just, so really basically your ritual is just, just questioning what, how, how all the, the time, hell it all happens. All, all the time. But, but, I, but, but I question everything all the time. You know, and I, 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 and I, and I, and I listen to, you know, I listen to the news in the mornings when I come to work. And, and sometimes I just laugh because you can, you, you sort of listen to politicians being interviewed and you listen to all that bullshit. And it's like, it's like, like they're like comedy sketches. And so, you know, start the week and the rest of it. I just love and, and that in the morning and some incredibly loud music. And I get to work feeling pretty good. What kind of music do you listen to? Everything. I have the most eclectic Spotify list <laughs> you've ever heard in your life. I can there's, imagine. There's everybody on it. Give, you know? give me some examples. Do, do, because depending when, on the mood. When you're, you're in, you know. when well, you're driving I, I, along with the oh, fireplace drawing. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, was, I, was, I was lucky enough to afford a Tesla. And you know what? That, that car is just incredible. And, and the car listens to me. So we have some great conversations. <laughs> you talk to your Tesla. <laughs> I talk to her. Because, you know, when you're in that thing in the morning and you recognize and you've got and you're surrounded by this brilliant technology, you think, yeah, there's a different world out there. And my God. And this car really does represent that world. Yeah. I remember it when really you first got it and world. I sat in it. It was like, wow. Well, this, 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 you suddenly moved into the, into the next generation of travel. Yeah. You know? And that's what that's that. And, and so there's something really quite nice in coming to work in that, even though it takes me too bloody long to get to work, which sometimes does my head in if you hit a bad traffic jam, but you know, it's, um, it, it, it's still somehow it, it's a great environment to travel in. Yeah. Which is, I'm lucky that. Yeah. I'm lucky with that. Definitely. Right. Okay. One of your most recent ventures is, um, a new business in a co-working space called U Space. Um, so why don't you just talk to me a little bit about what your initial vision was for that and, and the process of getting that up and running and off the ground now? And then, you know, what does the future look like? Okay, I mean, I, I reached the age where I can be sort of philanthropic and, and entrepreneurial at the same time. And, okay, people want to be mentored by me. I'm mentor them, whatever. You know, I, I, that, that really doesn't bother me. But I, I've looked at a lot of the co-working spaces, and I did a quick tour of a lot of co-working spaces in London. And I have to say, some of them were quite extraordinary. Um, interesting, innovative, um, over-the-top, weird. Um, and I thought, you know what? I, I look at all this WeWork stuff, and I think, why not build an environment that um, is a great place to work? Uh, and and then 
and not think, well, okay, I've got, I've got to bring so many people in to, to fill so many desks to make profit out of it. That, that, that wouldn't be the, that wouldn't, it, what it is, it's, 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 it's an open sort of space or palette of opportunity for different businesses to come in, individuals or mature businesses to talk to one another, mentor one another, uh, but, but, have, but have real innovation at its heart. And so I thought, well, you know what, I'll build a space and then see what happens. And, and so up, up to date, and I can't give too much away at the moment because there's a lot of work in progress here. There's going to be, there's going to be it's use space, certainly, where there's 100 desks for people to come and work in, in three different spaces, completely different environments. And that's for companies, freelancers, individuals. Yeah, anybody, wants to, any, any, anybody that wants to come If in. there was a small agency, they'd be able to set yeah, up, be able to here. Come up in here. Yeah, so we, we have offices and, we have, and we, have, we have desks. And the price range is actually cheaper than places like It's, we it's half the price of we yeah. yeah. Uh, and we've got parking, yay! Uh, <laughs> in Manchester got, is yeah. rare. <laughs> and we've got uh, six hundred plants in here, so we want to have the air is going to be clean. So it's going to be environmentally extremely friendly, uh, sandwiched as we are in Ardwick between the university and Manchester itself. So okay, um, we're also going to do use food. Uh, so we, we, we've got our first guy coming in over the next couple of months. It's going to be doing sort of organic uh, alternative burgers for people and things like that. Really nice, at a really good price for lunch. Great. And then we're also going to do use today, which is going to be. Um, around uh, sustainability. And that is that really is work in progress right now, where I want to talk to the sort of the good and honorable around us from the universities and from business <clears throat> and how to bring them together. That really is work in progress. Um, and, 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 and I'm very happy with it, you know. So um, as I say, there's no pressure for me to fill it. Uh, and it will, I, I imagine by the end of January, there's probably gonna be 60 to 80 people in here. And that's, and that's, that's fine, that's great. Um, and, and, and also, what's interesting about it is through the, through these opportunities, I'm also finding um, potential investment companies to invest in as well. And so, it, 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 if you think, well, this is this is a good environment, and I've got one or two other people that said to me, "Look, if you if you you know, I, I'm an investor. If you want to bring businesses in, I'll, I'll be very happy to back them here." And the, so, there, there's a lot going on yeah. in the background here um, to, for, to build this alternative space. There'll be those people who <clears throat> remember the photo link offices and um i remember a lot of people and in back in the photo link days before we rebranded re to 77 uh, a lot of people will come and, and and everyone's always really loved the space that we have whether that's the photographic studio or actually the main kind of creative building which is where we're sat right now um <clears throat> one of the things that everyone always remembered was the pink floor um and some of the other kind of decor and and furniture pieces at the time and and a lot of people would come and it was a bit of a wow factor from a photo link perspective but i think it's safe to say that you've taken it on another couple of levels in terms of bringing your personality and eccentricity into the actual building itself so when you first walk into the cafe you're greeted with a living wall, <laughs> basically. There's a, there's a living wall and a rhino. You can, but you get rhinos everywhere these days. And um, you know, apart in, from apart, in Africa, yeah, where they were first. Of course you do. And you know, we've, we've got to save one. And uh, and then we've got we've got a business room. We've got a green room. Uh, but it's going to get more and more eccentric because I want to bring in artists to do work. We've got a a, a brilliant graffiti artist about to start uh, next month Great. on the outside of the walls. Great. Uh, and and there's other pieces of sculpture and there's other other environmental objects to come in. Also, we want to bring bring in sort of projected pieces and things like that. So you've got art up on the walls. You've got a greenhouse. There's a rhino. The 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 coffee and all the the kind of all the normal things that you would expect in the kitchen and the fully working kitchen and everything else like that in terms of the um the types of businesses that you were touching on earlier i think that that aspect of it is quite interesting because um currently these we've got you know you've got like games developer you've got a photographer um you know there's going to be there are other other businesses in here as well as little black dress and, and some other businesses um but they're all working together, aren't they? Yes. I think that's the but thing really, that I'm... But really working together. Yeah, no, it's not just is, like... Which the, is fantastic, yeah. It's not just yeah. that we're like-minded people and you end up seeing them when you're making a coffee in like the Federation building or, or we work or whatever the other kind of competitors are to this. These guys are all actually collaborating and actually... Yeah, well, and, and that, of course, that is, of course is, is, that's great fun. And, and out of that, putting disparate elements together, disparate people together, will yes. no, normally never work together. Yeah. You start to think differently. Or yeah. you think, yeah, well, I could do that. I could do that, you know, and and that that that's that's what it's about. That's what makes it really exciting. 
and we've got the series of talks that we're doing as well, which is helping to try and educate people. So um, we're using people from 77 and people from the business yeah. at 77, well, it, the it, agency. It's, 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 joined, it, it's joined at the together. head, obviously, to 77. Yeah. And, and the whole idea being, as, as the sustainable piece comes on board, that, 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 that there should be a crossover of, of cultures yeah. uh, be, between, the two, uh, between the two buildings. I spent some time over here, and obviously I'm tr- I, I just give advice to people when they're, you know, when they're there. We've been doing some, um, some talks around social media advertising, some other kind of digital marketing channels and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, watch this space, see how it goes on. Um, I think a lot of a lot of what the future may hold for it isn't necessarily how it started. I think it's safe no, to say. No, 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 it, 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 it metamorphosis. Yeah, it, has, it has to grow, is it? It's it organically. Has, it has to grow and constantly change. Yeah. And, and, you know, so, and, and the point about it for me is that people that come in here need to influence the space. You know, it's not nothing is set in stone. So, you know, I've got 6,000 square feet here still open. That, yeah. you know we can use for, we can use for anything yes and, and so and that that that's great could be great a gym fun. could be could be anything could be anything really. yeah but not hot yoga <laughs> <laughs> anything but hot yoga, anything but hot yoga. <clears throat> people listening loving <clears throat> hot yoga are going to turn off bastard yeah, yeah. <laughs> um one of the things that i think is quite interesting because you invested and you're involved in a lot of businesses through the years but what is because you've always been interested in what the latest thing is and what the future looks like as well as obviously looking after initial interests what you know if you were to invest in a type of business in 2020 what type of business would you invest in i well i I look at the world at the moment i mean alternative universes um (laughs) (laughs) alternative universes you know tech tech businesses that i can understand yes you see for me I, i I still have to have a certain amount of knowledge. So we're going to invest in something. I have to understand what it is. Yes. I won't just invest in something because it, it, you know, I say, well, this is a great one to have a go at. No, 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 thanks. I want to know about it. I want to yes. feel it. You know, I want to enjoy it. Yes. And I think that, that, that is fundamental for me if, 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 I'm, if I'm going to invest. And do you something. think that's that's often the case with other investors as well? So if no, people are no, looking I for think, no, I think people go off in all sorts of different directions. Or you think, well, they'll they build a portfolio. Yeah. We'll, have, have, a, we'll have IT, we'll have fashion, we'll have, you know, we'll have commodities, we'll have, you know, and that, that's how you sort of break your portfolio down. Yes. It's, it's not like that for me. I, I don't think it's, it doesn't work like that. Right, okay. Know. So it, when you're when you're looking at sources of kind of advice and and looking for tips yourself, because you give people advice, but you also receive advice well, and I think that's part of the longevity for you know for what you've achieved so far. And I think <laughs> I'm just interested as to the the main sources of either content or tips or advice. Yeah, I, that you I, get. I think the thing about it is I've got you know my 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 youngest son is sort of 17 years old, and I look at everything that he does, and and I, I find it absolutely fascinating. And and what's happening now with you know with artificial intelligence is just is just incredible the speed of change yes that's going on in the world you know that you, you just how do you, how the hell do you keep up with it I don't know there's a lot of uh, people saying that AI is going to remove a lot of jobs but in many ways I think it will make, make millions of jobs yeah it, it, it will, will make, make jobs. it will make jobs but it allows us to think more creatively and spend less time on the menial tasks. Yeah, there's, there's no question about it. Everybody, you know, I mean, the steam train was a bugger when it arrived, wasn't it? You yeah. Know? Um, so it's, it's, ridic- <laughs> it's ridiculous to... to uh, have they changed that? <laughs> <laughs> do you I, mean they've got electric? <laughs> I wasn't around when it came around. <laughs> I'm sure it was the right bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but for the horses. People, people always <coughs> criticise everything if, unless they understand it, understand the potential of it. Yeah. You know, artificial intelligence, the potential is massive. It's a downside to, it's a downside to bloody everything. But, you know, it's not. it can't be worse than having a bloody world war. Yeah. You know, if, if, if there's a problem with something. The, the, because, let's face it, we, as a... As a, as a you know, as a, we animals, we human animals have gone through a hell over the last yeah. few hundred years. Is artificial intelligence going to help out a hundred? Nobody bloody knows. Yeah. But, you know, what, what did the atomic bomb do? It created peace. Mm. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> with, um, with looking at... The... So it's going to be deep there. It's going to be like your peace. Yeah, though. we're all right. <laughs> I expected nothing less. I have been nice with you. Um, so just thinking about giving people advice, because that's kind of what this is all about to be honest with you is to tell a story but also to give people advice and when if, if somebody was just starting out in the industry and let's just call it quite broad focus you know mar- let's call it marketing or, or content creation what kind of advice would you give to somebody coming into the industry for the first time don't reject anything oh, but you've got to have you keep your mind open to every single type of influence that there is and listen to people and then question what they've said don't take 
don't take the wisdom uh, of, of people on when people talk to you as, as, as golden and that's it. Yeah. Challenge whatever you hear and think, you know what? I, he may say this, but I actually disagree with that. I'm going to go down my own path here and I'm going to really find out whether that's right or not. So challenge the advice that you're given. Don't just accept it verbatim because that's wrong. And if you could go back and give advice to yourself, I'm just I'm, I'm doing this for a very specific reason. If you could go back and give advice to yourself at 30, at 40, at <coughs> 50. <God. laughs> well, I still feel about 40, so <laughs> I'd probably have to stop that. <laughs> if, but if you, if you were to go back and give yourself advice, your 30 year old self advice or your 40 year old self advice, well, what kind the, of advice would well, you Well, the give? crazy thing, this is where the different times, it would be buy more property. Buy more assets for yourself because the assets underpin everything you want to do in business. Okay. Because there's nothing Gives better. You more there's nothing freedom. better. You know, if, if you want to go to, if you're going, to, you want investment, you go to someone and say, look, you know, I want you to put a hundred thousand in. Oh, by the way, I'm putting fifty thousand in. Yeah. They're going to go, or twenty five thousand, or even ten thousand. They're going to go. Oh, right, it's making a financial commitment. That's and interesting. That, that today, I, I even people say, well, you don't use other people's money. No, you know, if you've got some of your own money, it, that goes a long, long way. Yeah. It's interesting because a lot of businesses now, especially this whole like Kickstarter, like crowdfunding, you that's, know, that's crowdfunding. It's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant, brilliant idea, but all you know, there are a lot of businesses that have only ever got to their next round of funding, but never really ran a successful business. So all yeah. they're doing is running <clears> on <throat> getting money for potential, going and going and going without actually making it successful. But that's but that's the biggest test, but isn't it? Whereby you have to have that vision of the future has to be really stoic, has to be really really strong. Because you know, it's, it, it, there are dozens of ways of getting funding for businesses, and there are tens of, well, there are millions of small businesses out there. But there's only going to be a handful that are going to make it. Okay. Well, um, just to kind of finally wrap up on this conversation, which is really good. Um, what kind of words of wisdom do you want to leave the listeners with? <laughs> oh God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I don't. Well, there isn't a God. I don't really disappoint <laughs> people about this, but there isn't. So he's not actually going to help you. Even though I make that say that expression occasionally, I don't believe in it anyway. But never mind. Um, be liberal. Just be up, complete and utterly liberal, and read Edward de Bono because even though you're going to say, "God, this is this is, this stuff's been going around for years," yeah, it has. But you know what? It's as good today as it's ever been. I've just read Frazzled. You read Frazzled, and you know what? There's two elements in there that Edward de Bono came along. Yeah. I love just one. I'll go back to one thing that Edward de Bono did. Okay. There you go. Which is his seven hats. Okay. Yes. Whereby. You you force people within a force within a group to go off in one direct, all agree with one another, all disagree with one another, all do a bit of that old, you know, what's the vision of the future? All look at it financially, is it going to work or is it not going to work? Force people to change their minds and, and look at something in a different way, and you'd be amazed what comes out of that. And that was Edward Demono did that. And that was picked up in China and major industries all over the world, that way of thinking, the seven hats. Force people to think differently. Um, and, and so the man said, no, you can't paint that building red. Say, well, actually, you know, why? And think why. It could be green, could be blue, could be pink, could be striped. So force people to think in a different way. And, and, and you get so much out of that. You really do. That's my advice. That's a great way to end it. Thank you very much, David. Um, and if people are looking to get in touch with you in any way, where, you know, on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or Instagram or anything like that, what's the best way of getting in touch with the you? The Tesla charging station on the M6. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually there. Right? <laughs> come, come the days of the week. Um, just, just da the David Walter on LinkedIn. Just da David at uspace.co.uk. Right. And, you know, somebody will probably respond to that email. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm your host, Paul Casey. If you'd like to connect with me, find me on LinkedIn or on Instagram, the username Casey Digital, um, or just search for Paul Casey anywhere you find me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.